this poem. It's my humble ode to the Chowmin. For the three people in the room who've heard this poem before, I hope you are not taking your Chowmin for granted anymore. <laughs> Chowmin. Nang, Chow, meaning stir fry, Main, meaning roots. In Calcutta, Chow Mein was ubiquitous in the 90s in urban Bengali households. Through a strange semantic change, the word was shortened to Chow. The stir friedness of the Mein gaining precedence over the mainness of the Mein in the foreign tongue. Ma made white Chow for Sunday breakfast when there was not enough time to fry luchi or porta in the morning. She usually slept till 9 a.m. on Sundays, her only luxury for many years. White chow was white, like a white flag, like off-white handmade paper, like my Jewish Christian white American partner skin, white. Wheat noodles gently boiled in hot water and then lightly fried in vegetable oil with some chopped onions, salt, pepper, and sometimes an egg on indulgent weekends. No sauces, no food coloring, no pretensions. Simple, like most middle class Calcutta's. Baba brought home chicken chow doused in chili sauce from local eateries on Wednesdays, some Wednesdays, for dinner when we needed a midweek break from our bitter gourd, bottle gourd, silk gourd, apple gourd, ivy gourd, pointed gourd, unexciting, unexotic routine. My friends and I took veg chow with ketchup for lunch, at least once every week when we were in high school. The chow turned cold in our tiffin boxes, but there was fire enough in our 16-year-old hearts to make up for congealed noodles. Our steel tiffin carriers were so desi that I'm embarrassed of them now. In my present, no plastic pontificating yet plastic Tupperware using first world situation. Back then, nothing could embarrass us. Youth has no shame. Shame comes with age. We would surreptitiously pass our ugly, eco-friendly, cold tiffin boxes around, way before lunch break, feasting on chow while the teacher droned on in the class about the cardiac system or tectonic plates. A lot of my childhood seems to have been spent watching with doleful eyes, roadside food cart vendors, creating magic with chow Ma and Baba always denied me the exquisite pleasure of eating anything from the roadside. I still remember Ma asking me in wonder and in exasperation, if not in complete shock, how on earth is that dirty thing from the streets more appealing to you than let's say a healthy fruit salad or brunch at Fleury's or Peter Cat? The forbidden has always been more tempting, Ma. Always. The Bengali Chinese chow mein was such a big part of my growing up years that when I went to Beijing for the first time in 2010 and had authentic Chinese noodles, I felt the ground beneath my feet shaking in anger. I felt cheated, betrayed, let down, and decided quite petulantly to live on burgers and fries in China for the rest of that trip. <laughs> to a 17-year-old me, Bengali Chinese was the real deal. Everything else was a sorry simulation. I tossed some noodles in a woke for breakfast this morning. It was nothing like the chow mein of my childhood. I used organic, semolina-based Italian angel hair pasta and not coarse wheat noodles. Free-range brown eggs, which the roadside vendors of Calcutta probably had no clue of. Extra virgin olive oil, instead of what dad used to call sea gray, inedible, dubious white oil, which was always very generously used by the aforementioned vendors, and shiracha in place of ketchup. 
and my plate of East George Street Instagram noodles turned out to be too hipster to be humble like my old Calcutta. Yet, the smell of fried eggs mixing with the main felt closer to home than anything else has in my last few years in Rhode Island. I took my charming and my childhood for granted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I must add that I returned to the city three months ago. I returned to the country three months ago. And it's absolutely lovely to be here today because this is the warmth that I've received. I seem to know half this room. I love the poetry circle in Calcutta. I love people like Linda. I love people that are working with Rhythm Divine Poets, uh, Sophia, Ani, and Amita. Because, like I said at the beginning, maybe it's easy to write poetry, but who's reading it? Who's talking about it? Who's buying it? Who are we writing for? Um, as an academic, as somebody that's a professor and is also pursuing a PhD, I've realized that it's a very isolating process. It's time that we started coming together and um, sharing our food and our poems. Thank you so much. <laughs>